Hey guys, uh, welcome to what I believe is episode 16 of Uncommonly Common Conversations. Are we up to 16, Kurt? Is that what I said earlier? Yes, 16. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There is a lost episode, which I might edit one day. Um, but yes, so episode 16 is where we're at. And tonight's episode, we'll be discussing uh, the current state of comic book films in 2023. Uh, tonight, we are joined by Kurt, Julian, and Rowan. So, uh, Kurt, do you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. How are we tonight? Thank you. Uh, Julian. Hey guys, Julian here, and I'm a staunch defender of the MCU up until Phase Three. So Phase Three was where you drew the line. End of Phase Three. All right, all right, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yep, cool. Uh, and Rowan. And I'm Rowan. Uh, back again. Uh, back by unpopular demand. Let's <laughs> go. <laughs> what do you mean, Rowan? Our subscribers yearn for you to come on every episode. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I think we're. I think we are solely in double digits. I think there's at least ten organic subscribers to this podcast outside of the people that I recruit to come on here. So, you know, we're making an impact. It only takes a trickle to start a flood. That sort of thing. That's that's the motto for uncommonly common. <laughs> okay. So, um, what's everyone been up to last since we last spoke? Uh, Kurt, I think it's been a couple of weeks. What are you playing at the moment? Uh, yeah, it's been two weeks since uh, we last spoke on here. Um, still playing Starfield. I'm up to, to 15, 16 hours of it so far. So far, so good. I've started to enjoy it a little bit more than what I was last time we spoke about it. And, of course, old faithful Fortnite has also been on the cards a lot lately. Look, man, are you um, beating those Zoomers? Uh, anyone I, I can at the moment. So my, my brother-in-law plays Fortnite now. He's 14. And he's bringing in, on average, roughly $300 every two weeks from competition winnings. $300 US every two weeks on competition winnings. So this kid's side gig is basically just winning like mid to low level Fortnite competitions for US cash in his PayPal account. Are you that good, Kurt? Are you, is this like side hustle good? Or are you just sort of like jumping around, building towers with wings, whatever it is you do in Fortnite? Uh, at this stage, it's more or less just for fun. Okay, I yeah. play with the, the same like three or four people every night, usually for a few hours. Oh, but well. um, I would I wouldn't say that I'm a horrible player. I could quite happily play in a, a tournament. Yeah. Oh, what's man? Uh, Julian, how you been, dude? You've you've just moved house. I sure have. And. And I have been playing Miles Morales recently on the PS5. Oh, nice. It's just one of the best expansion packs I've ever played besides the Witcher stuff. Um, and I'm sure a few Elder Scrolls stuff as well. It's the, the hype from across the Spider-Verse plus the hype for Spider-Man 2. It just got me in a real Miles mode. Um, and it's pretty much flawless. No complaints. It's, it's great expansion. No I, I don't... I don't love his Venom powers, though. Um, no, no, and, and, and not not because, like, I dislike the Miles Morales character or anything. It's it's more that I, I found that the characters start... The, the, the powers start to become very, like, almost cartoonish towards, sort of, towards the end. And like, one of the things I like about... I mean, I'm saying that about Spider-Man, for Christ's sake. So I'm aware of the irony. But, you know, like, Spider-Man sort of... There's a there's a grounded type element to it where it doesn't feel like he's manifesting a power, um, while Miles Morales kind of feels like sort of more like an X Men character than a Spider Man character. Yeah, but I also did hundred percent that game and is one of the two games I've hundred percented in the last decade, with the other one being the first Spider Man on PlayStation Four. So I I'm certainly not begrudging the game. It's stunning, massive, beautiful achievement. Are you getting the second one? Fuck yeah, hell yeah, dude! I'm just trying to like carve out. Like, yeah, that, I'm just trying to carve out time in my life for that one next week because I definitely want to do some swinging in that game. I find it's like one of those games where it's like the actual just act of playing it is so just good. Like, just the, the act of just swinging across the city is enjoyable enough. It's the best traversal we've had in the last couple of gens. Yeah, I think I'm sort of comparing it to like Batman in particular because obviously the Arkham series is you know sort of the the precursor to Spider Man in a lot of ways. I definitely think that what they did with Spider Man far outshines anything that Rocksteady did with Batman and the Arkham verse. 
Oh, controversial take. Yeah, I saw your face there, Julian. Baiting you. Baiting <laughs> you. Say it. Say Ill. it. <laughs> say it. <laughs> say it for the Master listeners. <laughs> um, Arkham Asylum, I think, has an incomparable mood. There's there's nothing quite like it besides things like Bioshock and Silent Hills oh. and Resident Evil. Uh, yeah, Arkham Asylum, I'll always defend that. Yeah. But Arkham Asylum came out in 2009. Hmm. True. Just saying. There's a lot of like, and maybe this is like, maybe this is just a little bit of like a nostalgia thing, but I think because like millennials, like the 360 and the PS3 generation was, we were teenagers during that period. So it feels very recent to us. But if you do sort of take a bit of, sorry, Rowan, I didn't mean to be ages then. Oh. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, fuck, here we go. <laughs> I better leave. The old man better leave now. Yeah. So it begins. Um, but like, you know, because we were sort of teenagers during that, well, most of us were teenagers during that period. Um, like, I, I think that we kind of forget that like some of these games, particularly the Rocksteady Batman ones, are actually quite old now by gaming standards. Um, and like, I, mean, I went back and replayed Arkham City on PC about a year ago. Um, I, I sort of booted that up again. And, and the game still, like, it still holds up well, but you can, you can feel that it's very much off its time. Just, no, 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 you just agree. You, you look like you were going to stab me before, Julian. I thought you were going to have a, like, a bit of a comeback <laughs> for that one. <laughs> you're you're predicting yourself. Uh, Rowan, how you been, man? Yeah, not too bad. Um, playing the usuals. Playing yeah. the, I should just have a play, press, uh, play button here where I go, I've been playing Destiny. Surprise. Um, I'm one of those poor suckers that just is so involved in that story that I just can't give it up. Um, I need to see it through to the end. Um, and we're almost, almost there. So uh, I'm excited for that. And then um, I've been eyeing off the new Assassin's Creed Mirage. Ooh, that does look fun. They're, um, so for those that have played the more recent ones, it is more like the old school one rather than the newer open world thing. So if you like the open world one, maybe give it a shot. I'm not going to say it's going to work for you, but if you like the older Altair and Ezio Editore, go for it. So I'm, yeah, waiting for the weekend for that. It it, it does look it does look good again. I I, I have kind of had I, I go for this like phase every probably twelve months where I have like a real itching to play one of the old school Assassin's Creed games like um like Black Flag and Unity and seeing this one coming out again. I kind of feel like I just want to have a sort of like turn my brain off and just have some fun in like a different part of the world, um, which I kind of. I kind of miss that from AC. Like, I, I get what they tried to do with sort of the big, wide scoping, sort of, you know, RPG type stuff. But I, I think, like, Valhalla just broke me. Like, that game was just so. It was, it was massive. So, it was massive, but it felt shallow. Like, it was like one of those games where you, they, it probably would have been a much better game if they just condensed the map size and then focused on. But then again, this is Ubisoft we're talking about. So that's an entire conversation in its own. Yeah. I really wish they would go back to um, AC2 and Brotherhood. That was like peak AC there. Like yeah. that mul that multiplayer, fuck, that was so good. That way you could just, yeah, anyway. I really like to We could do a whole episode on that. No, let's do that. Let's, let's do an Assassin's Creed special. Yeah, I'm definitely. Yeah, that sounds good to me um, too. I remember uh, around the time of Odyssey, Someone from Ubisoft said the reason why we keep making these games as big as they are and filled with so many collectibles is because when we do, when we get feedback from our players and our testers, the majority say they want more collectibles, they want more stuff to do, but then the fatigue from the rest of us players and also the media outlets is like, okay, it's a little bit too big, let's wind it back, which is why I think going forward, they're doing both at the same time. Um, I believe Assassin's Creed Hex might be going down that smaller, more focused Mirage Brotherhood Revelations S type game. And then you've got the big ones like Assassin's Creed Red, the, the one set in Japan, I believe, which is going to be Valhalla, Odyssey, Origins. So Ghost maybe of that's how they. Sorry? Ghost of Tsushima. Correct. Ghost of Tsushima already did it perfectly. <laughs> yeah, it's going to get messy. You just know someone at Ubisoft had the, that Japanese-inspired samurai Assassin's Creed just sitting on the shelf, just waiting for their opportunity. They're just like, yeah, okay, we're we're going to do Egypt, and then we're going to like we're going to do Greece, and then then we're going to do then we're going to do Japan, and then Ghost of Tsushima just comes out and like, oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, I've just been playing Cyberpunk 
Uh, so I've uh, restarted that. Um, I'm still just doing the intro missions with like the the, the grounding mission with Jackie. Um, we have to do the initial heist. Uh, so, but I'm finding that because um, I tried playing it when it first came out on Series X, and I probably put about ten to fifteen hours into it, and then just stopped playing it. Like the game was just janky and unfinished, and I. I it wasn't that I had any hate towards CD Projekt Red because the game technically ran on the Series X. I didn't have any performance issues that were sort of game breaking, but um, it just it just felt unfinished, and it felt like they took a lot of shortcuts to try to get it to production. Um, but yeah, this this two point patch, uh, it does feel like a completely brand new game. Um, and yeah, really, yeah, really digging how well it is running as well too. Like it's a it's a very pretty game on on my PC. Um. Yeah, so it's definitely definitely something anyone else is thinking about checking out um, Cyberpunk if you didn't get around to it when it launched. It's yeah, now it's yeah, hundred percent the perfect time to look into it. How's the crowd density now on PC? Much better. Um, they've uh, yeah, it's a good thing you mentioned actually because crowd density, um, AI vehicle driving, police. There's a massive police presence in the game now. Um, I'm not saying it's like GTA Five quality. Like I still think Rockstar is definitely the gold standard for that sort of urban feeling but um it, it doesn't feel like you're just walking around back lot industrial streets like the first one did um but in saying that though it, it is a game as well where it's like how can i put this um it feels bigger than it is um so they do a good job at sort of giving the impression of this very large sort of go anywhere type city but it's actually you it, yeah it's 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 a lot it's a lot when you're playing it it's actually a lot smaller and a lot less sort of um there's a lot less to do than you would probably anticipate especially coming from something like the witcher where you know that that map is just enormous you, you're not getting that sort of sense of scale with this game it's a lot more focused but again that's not necessarily a bad thing either um because it, it does feel like the city does have a lot more personality and character to it because you are sort of confined to at least that one sort of location for more or less. Yeah. Um, awesome, guys. So uh, now part of tonight's topic uh, was inspired by some recent Marvel news that's come out, um, which is that the, the Daredevil Disney Plus series has been... The writers and the showrunners and the directors have all been fired. Um, they've apparently filmed about six episodes already out of 18 and they've all been scrapped. And the instruction is to go back to the drawing board and try again. Um, and so the reason why I kind of wanted to talk about that is that if you if you look at sort of the state of comic book films in, in and the comic book properties... If you rewind five years, those were the biggest entertainment properties annually. There was nothing that was doing Marvel numbers. Um, even even DC was regularly breaking a billion dollars for films. You know, they may have not been profiting a billion dollars, but they were breaking the billion dollar barrier. I mean, Aquaman for Christ's sake is a billion dollar movie. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Yeah. Um, so what I thought we might just sort of have a bit of a chat tonight about is kind of just sort of the the origin of these films, so how they start to become relevant. Um, I'd like to talk about sort of the peak with Marvel, um, particularly Phase 3 and, you know, that discussion is that should it have actually ended with Endgame? Um, and then sort of what kind of went wrong post-Phase 3 because I think that we could all probably draw a bit of line in the sand and say that the peak of these films was May 2019 when Endgame came out. And for the last four years, there's really not been anything that's of note that justifies why it needs to exist other than just continuing a legacy. Um, so our first things first then is the, the origin of modern films um, launched with X-Men in the early 2000s. Uh, I think it was, you actually think it was the year 2000. Um, the original X-Men movie, the only really notable thing from that is Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. From that franchise um i don't think that i personally don't think that the x-men films i don't think they really hold up that well i know x-men 2 does a bit of a different position but i know with like that original x-men movie it was really much a proof of concept but it was a proof of concept that worked um it made money it had a it was a different take on something and it was actually it, it worked 
Um, you then have the Spider-Man movies, um, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films, where again, Spider-Man 1, proof of concept, but it worked. And then Spider-Man 2, definitely something that peaked um, for that for that initial trilogy. And then much like, ironically, what happened 15 years later with Marvel, or sorry, 10 years later with Marvel, you get Spider-Man 3, which became yeah yeah thanks julian uh just for those that are listening julian is currently doing the uh the evil peter parker dance from spider-man 3 uh which he did concerningly well um you get to spider-man 3 and you have a film that for all intents and purposes is beholden to the canon established in the previous two movies and it's not telling a new story it's telling a continuation of the previous stories and i i kind of think that's where marvel is at today but i might just throw it across just throw it out to the room so sort of talking about that 2000s period um with the exception of the dark knight and batman begins was there anything else that kind of and and iron man was there anything else that kind of came out from that sort of 2000s period that influenced well at least that you think started had an influence in what happened in the 2010s with the real sort of peak of comic book films i actually want to throw back a little bit further yeah um which is to batman in the early 1990s yeah okay. late yeah. 80s yeah. um mm-hmm. with the tim burton batman um i think that was actually quite good and it um it did set up a universe that batman belonged in um that could then progress for throughout the movie franchise which then you got you know Batman Returns, the famous uh, slogan of the Bat, Cat, and the Penguin, um, with uh, Danny DeVito as the Penguin and Michelle Pfeiffer as um, Catwoman, which was perfect, perfect movie. I loved it. Loved it. Um, and then, so it's kind of like mirroring what we're seeing in Marvel, where it's like a couple of really good movies, and then it just kind of peaked, and then kind of went, it jumped the shark, basically. So then had the third Batman, which was, eh. All right. Um, and then the fourth one, which was just full on comic book from the pages, um, massive um, uh, set pieces, and just didn't look great. I'm going to be honest with that. So, some of the visuals in that, which I think has come through on some of the properties that we're seeing in phase four and five of Marvel at the moment, um, you know, they're being rushed to get these things out and they're just not being done well um and then you can even throw back to the three x-men movies with the third movie which was a w2f moment for me with the the phoenix saga one of the classic stories of x-men was just i don't even know what know what they are what they did with that that was just completely fucked um to change the story so much i was devastated when i saw that movie with how that ended because you know you see the you see the phoenix under the water in the end of the the second one i'm like yes phoenix saga amazing and then we got number three and i was just like no no this is not okay not good um so i think that that kind of you know reflects what's happening now like they build up such a good property and then they just go let's we're gonna get bigger and better and like go further and faster um to quote the furious x franchise uh and uh they just go too far it's just uh, just that little bit too far like i think it's good that the originals in each of the kind of property universes are a little bit set in kind of reality um but now we're kind of getting to that ground where it's um still comic book but it's gone a little bit too far for the general population to get on board with that's my take. Uh, Julian? Yeah, that's fair. Um, I'm glad that we had a lot of experimentation in the 2000s to test what worked and what didn't work. I'm glad that we had different tones as well, from the comedic, from the family stuff, to you know, the Batman Begins, the Dark Knight, Unbreakable as well. I'm going to throw Unbreakable in as a movie that is not a big name but it did have an interesting superhero tone to it um 
And even with the MCU, they were still kind of finding their feet in the late 2000s, and it wasn't until uh, 2012 onwards that they actually had a consistent tone and, and a consistent propulsive energy. So even they were trying to find their feet initially. Um, I will defend Spider-Man 3 and say that as... That's just because you love the dancing. Not just that. I love the whole goblin through line from Spider-Man 1 to 2 to 3. I think yeah. that's very, very effective. I love the friendship between uh, Peter and Harry. I love that um, the romantic relationship between Peter and MJ doesn't end on a happy note. It's more like, fucked up, Peter. Um, but, you know, because we're human, I'm going to give you another chance. And it may not be happy. It may be happy. Uh, yeah, so... And, and also the music. Danny Elfman really gave it his all in the first two movies and the Christopher Young kind of had, had a pretty big couple of shoes to fill and he did a pretty good job. Um, Danny Elfman has been a sentinel uh, throughout the comic book scoring. So he did Batman 89, Batman Returns, um, and then Spider-Man 1 and 2, and then tried with Justice League and I think Multiverse of Madness. Um, we had some really good music throughout this entire period because as the comic books are pretty much modern mythology. They need to be as epic and grand as possible and heroic as possible. So me as a big music lover, I was spoiled all the way through the 2000s um, and even with the original Batman movies and even John Williams' iconic Superman scores, which is you know, the most iconic thing ever. Um, I, for one, am glad for the music elements of it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> for me, I've been... A Big fan of X-Men. Um, ever since I was a kid, I collect um, c comic books from the X-Men series. Mainly anything with Wolverine, either on the cover or as part of, as a main character. It's a shame. I should have grabbed some out of the office to show you guys. <laughs> but there's a big stack of just Wolverine ones. <laughs> um, I don't know. The... Probably the start of the movie series that I most liked him in it was probably The Last Stand. And then when it went on to the trilogy, um, those, yeah, the three movies that were about him were certainly standout favourites for me. You sort of were able to understand more about his life and how, um, he sort of existed throughout throughout time. I mean, that first standalone Wolverine film, which has an awesome tie-in video game, actually, if anyone remembers the, the Wolverine game from like 08, 09, um, had a really cool feature where your, uh, your health bar was how much damage he was physically taking in-game, and then as you recover, he starts to physically heal on screen. So it's just, just, a, just a cool gimmick from late 2000s. Um, but I mean, but that, that first... That first Wolverine movie with like the most notable thing from that is the fact that Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool becomes the butt of a joke for that movie going forward. Um, and, and I think that's kind of like a good example of when the, the name brand of the character isn't enough to actually carry a bad film. And I, I think that that's, that starts to become a bit of a theme that we begin to see in the 2010s. So I might just jump in for a sec, Kurt. Um, oh, sorry, unless you, could, you had any other, any other points from the 2000s? Oh, cool. Um, That's gone. So like the, the two most influential films that came out of the 2000s, and sorry, I know this might be a bit sacrilegious, Julian, but it is it is actually Iron Man um, and then The Dark Knight. Um for all intents and purposes, those movies pretty much set the tempo for what the next decade of box office was going to look like. Um, and what you had out of Iron Man and The Dark Knight were two different tonal shifts in comic book films. You had The Dark Knight, which was a film, and then you had Iron Man, which was a summer blockbuster movie. And I'll use the distinction between film and movie based on sort of the how serious it's taken the craft. But for all intents and purposes, comic book films either became or comic books either became a we want to do the Dark Knight, but with Superman, or we need the next Iron Man. So mm. 
Um, and also, fun fact: uh, Iron Man is the highest-grossing indie film of all time. Just for just for record or reference on that one, um, which is a bit of a curious little detail from that period because it was actually an independently produced film because Disney hadn't bought it at that point. Um, no. Yeah. So I might just I might just talk about DC for a second because um, I've, I've got a feeling that Marvel's going to get pretty top level. We'll be pretty pretty deeply going into Marvel later, but. I, I think that DC is probably a good example of just how bad comic book movies can be, and and I I, I don't I don't mean that to say that everything that DC has produced is bad because it definitely isn't. But one of the biggest issues with comic book films is that, and this is the same with comics as well, the genre doesn't end. And so, like, if you look at comics, and uh, sorry, no, Kurt, you're a bit of a collector, and but I've just, you know, if it, I I was really into Batman comics in the early 2010s, um, like I, not obviously to like you know Alan's level, but I was I was reading them pretty heavily for a while there. The shit just doesn't finish; it just keeps going and going and going, and then they do a soft reboot, and then it keeps going and going and going until eventually you get photocopies upon photocopies, and what made the characters originally good are just gone. And I think that the challenge that you know the DC had was that they wanted to compete with Marvel in the 2010s. They wanted to do their own cinematic Avengers, you know, they wanted to do the Justice League. And they made a major mistake by front loading it with effectively the Justice League film. They didn't put enough time in place to actually build out the characters. But they also made the issue of, and you know, this is a running joke within DC itself. How does Batman fight a god? You, know, you have this, you have this thing where the character of Batman, which is the most popular DC character by far, how does how does Batman fight a god and make it look legitimate? And then when you look at Superman, how do you make Superman? vulnerable without it being tacky and i i personally think Zack snyder did a phenomenal job with batman vs superman i think that that's a movie that gets way too much hate i think that's actually minus the stupid martha thing at the end but i, I think that you know Zack snyder actually did a legitimately good job with that film but the problem the is other- is that you've then got you know, the Snyderverse with these characters, but then at the same token, you, you want to bring in Shazam or you want to bring in Black Adam. Like you want to start bringing in these other DC characters and all of a sudden you've got this, you know, it's basically Dragon Ball Z. It's everyone's one-upping each other for who's the most powerful in the room and who's the most powerful demigod. And I just don't think that that sort of cinematic universe really works. Was what, do, what, are, your, what are your guys' thoughts on... DC films from the 2000s well keeping it sort of pre-2017 when you when you look at the list <clears throat> there's a lot like I'm just looking at it from here at the moment and from the Dark Knight onwards like what uh, Watchmen was alright Jonah Hex was that was boring Green Lantern that was a flop Suicide Squad, I didn't actually mind that. Well, Suicide Justice Squad's League. worth talking about because they they made they did make a genuine attempt with Suicide Squad to sort of do that. You know, it was David Ayer for Christ's sakes. You know, the, the movie he did before Suicide Squad was Fury. Like the you know, yeah. you know, I I I want to see the David Ayer director's cut of Suicide Squad. Not that they'd ever be brave enough to release that, but you know, that was the, the, they made an attempt with DC to try to do something that was profound and different but they just ended up screwing it up so badly and i think that suicide squad is really what set the tempo for the remainder of that snyder vs dc run and we'll get to james gunn and we'll get to suicide squad 2 and the joker and stuff a bit later but uh, yeah I, I just that was something around that 2016 period where it just became apparent that these movies were not they were not it wasn't working for dc and they just doubled down I think pre Shazam is probably the yeah uh, yeah the, the benchmark. Sorry, the benchmark. The, the end of the chapter. 
Shazam was a different understanding and appreciation of what audiences like. So before that, from Man of Steel to whatever came just before Shazam was just... Uh, but I mean, Julian, Aquaman. Man, like I know we, we'd spoken about this over the years, but you know, do you think that... Like, do, do you think that... the oh, shit, I haven't even mentioned The Dark Knight Returns. Oh, sorry, The Dark Knight Rises. That's how... Anyway, we, we, we covered that in the, in the, the Christopher Nolan episode, but, but do, you, do you think that The Dark Knight was too good for its own good? Because it just left this legacy of films trying to imitate it when they really shouldn't have been trying to imitate it. I don't think it was too good for its own good. I think every film should aspire to be of the highest quality, regardless if it takes itself seriously or just genuinely wants to be fun, such as Iron Man. I, I still consider Iron Man as much of a film as The Dark Knight because they serve very different purposes and they're both very successful uh, and then in individually. Um, but yes, it's almost laughable how much Hollywood swung to, okay, let's repeat The Dark Knight. Um, and I think that's a wonderful thing as, as a legacy to have. You, you want movies like that. Yeah, except ironically, The Dark Knight Rises didn't try to repeat The Dark Knight, but that's a, we have a whole episode of me <laughs> ranting about that fucking movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rowan, um, what are your views, man, on DC films from sort of like that 2010s period, um, probably going up until about Joker, because that's a different conversation. Yeah, um, so I'm just looking at the list as well, cause just to refresh my memory um, as to what's going on. So, um, like, even some of these, I like, I know they're, Bat they're Batman characters, they're DC characters, but I had no idea. And I know that some of them have been bought um, after the fact. So, like, Watchmen was, I think, a great film based upon the, um, the novels, the graphic novel, like, shot for shot and some of those things, it was just mind-blowing to see that on the screen. Um, but at that point in time, it wasn't part of DC and it was just, or maybe it was one of the imprints, I can't remember. Anyway, um, Watchmen, it was really good. I, I do think Watchmen was about five to ten years too early cinematically. I think if that <laughs> was a movie that came out in the mid-2010s, that movie would have, that would have been a billion-plus dollar film. I just think that Watchmen came yeah. out, it, audiences weren't ready for that type of movie unfortunately in 2009 no definitely not definitely not um and then like it's I, I have this issue with dc movies where because batman begins and the dark knight was so successful everything needed to be dark and gloomy yeah and that's my problem with dc is that um you've got these characters that exist in kind of different worlds but the same world so, you know, Batman generally works at night in the gloomy Gotham City. But then you've got, you know, Superman who's, you know, bright sunny days out and about doing stuff, Flash as well. Um, and they just don't... To put them in a dark world doesn't really work with their characters. So that's that's my one issue that I have with DC. I loved some of the films. I thought some of them were great. Um, I thought the first Wonder Woman was really good. To be honest, I'm one of the the the, the people that loved Wonder Woman. Um, uh, I think it was done really well. And Justice League, I was kind of like, why are we putting the cart before the horse? This doesn't make sense. We don't know half these characters, like Cyborg. Who, like, I know I know Cyborg because I'm I read comics. Um, I know the Flash. I know all the people in the Justice League because I watch the Justice League animated movies, which I freaking adore. Um, but to have them introduced into the, the cinematic universe, they are not actually know much about them. People kind of like, what's going on? I don't get why this person's important in this lineup. Um, and then just kind of shoehorning them into it to make it work just didn't work for me. Um, but there were some standout hits in there. I do like some of them. As I said, Wonder Woman was great. I am one of the people that loved Aquaman because I actually love Aquaman, the character. But... Um, it was a, to me. It was fun. It wasn't a serious DC movie. That's why I enjoyed it because I wasn't going in there expecting much. Because also you got Jason Momoa, who really doesn't play too serious. From what I've seen, doesn't play too serious characters. So I knew I wasn't going to get a a dark DC movie. I was going to get a little bit lighter, a bit fun, and it was for most of it. I actually rewatched it the other week. So anyway, well, yeah. 
I, but the other um, ones, yeah. I took Alison on a date to go see Wonder Woman, um, and she's never let that down because apparently I was too interested in the film. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what you need to do with Alison is you need to give her what make her watch Wonder Woman and then make her watch uh, Wonder Woman 1984 and then go, okay, which one is actually promoting the female figure and which one is just using it for sex yeah. and then see what she says. Uh, and, Wonder Woman and, gets a bad and Rowan, sometimes. Um, the mistake you've made with that is that you're assuming that we're going to get around to watching Wonder Woman 1984 and I'm not going to get stopped short <laughs> with the, wait, why do you want to watch the next one? <laughs> To prove how good the first one was compared to the <laughs> second. Um, yeah, no, I completely agree with you, man. Um, there's something about those films in that period where they, they, they totally, they couldn't find a consistency with it. And the fact that they then, they then started to jump styles meant that it became, the, the prospect of bringing these characters back together became trickier and trickier. Um and you, you start to see that with uh, the Suicide Squad, to be perfectly honest with you. I think that really encapsulates that. And, you know, you've got that Birds of Prey film in there as well too. Um, you know, you, you've got these sort of movies that are just individual characters on them are brilliant. Like, I think the casting in DC was brilliant. Um, mm. Every every character that was cast in DC absolutely nails it, with probably the exception of Ezra Miller, but that's a different story. Um you know, Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn is superb. Um, Jason Momoa is perfect as Aquaman. Uh, you know, Ben Affleck's Batman, I think, is a travesty. I think that that was... No, oh. no, 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 no. Sorry, let me finish. Let me finish because he didn't get his chance. They should have just given Ben Affleck the ability to self-direct his own post-divorce alcohol-fueled depression movie in which he plays brutal Batman. He may have killed himself doing it, but if that's the price we had to pay for that artistic gem, then I'm totally down for that. I'm sorry, of course, don't kill yourself, Ben. You, you seem like a wonderful guy. But you know, I, I think that the fact that DC did not just double down and give us a standalone Batman film with that char- with that actor and that interpretation of the character is such a loss to what could have been amazing. But in saying that, that Batman film should have happened before Justice League. That should have set between, you know, Batman versus Superman and Justice League. There should have been that standalone story. And that's how they should have introduced Jared Leto's Joker and Harley Quinn and those Suicide Squad characters. I think in that, um, in the Batman v Superman, like just the weight of Batman and the fighting that he did was just, oh, it's, it's brilliant. it was phenomenal. It was so good. Like that's the kind of Batman I want to see, that heavy hitter that, you know, uses his, uh, his gadgets to, um, in effect, control the fight. It was just, just the, those heavy hitting fight scenes where he's in that like I don't know if it was a warehouse or something I can't remember or a loft yeah, when he smashes building, someone yeah. through the floor like, oh, perfection. Uh, and you know that perfection. whole thing about like Batman killing people because you know he's literally using guns on the Batmobile and shooting people. And yeah, you know, I'm I'm kind of like, fine, do it. Like that's the biggest weakness about Batman is his inability to actually. You know, I, okay, I get that there's like a revisionist sort of moral code about Batman that he doesn't kill people, but. Let's face it, he's made enough people paraplegics that death would probably be preferable to them. So, you know, there's a whole thing with Batman where it's just the fact that he was pushed to that point where murder was something that he didn't even think about. Like, I want that story. Like, I want to see the Batman story in which he becomes the killer that he's trying to stop. Like, that would be that would be awesome for me. Um, but I don't... Yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, 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 I was just going to say, I just, I just don't think that it's just it's just a lost opportunity and it's very disappointing. So from my understanding, Batman vs. Superman draws heavily from the Dark Knight Returns, the comic yeah. book, in which Batman uses guns. Yeah, actually. he does. I can't remember whether he actually kills in that book, I think he does, I actually. I think he does kill in that one. Yeah. Got it. So I think it serves dual purposes. One, to reference that arc in Dark Knight Returns, but also at the end of Batman vs. Superman, the movie, he literally says, I need to do better. I need to live by Clark's example and... Hence, I'm not going to kill as much or kill at all. So uh, I think it was to show that arc. And and I think that there should have been a prequel to it with that. There should have been something that's establishing him and not just with the World Trade Center analogy. Um, like there should have been something that it didn't need to be obviously another Batman origin story because that's been done. And we can talk about the Batman and the Joker film later, but 
just there was something within that that I felt like if we got just at least one standalone Ben Affleck Batman film with Jared Leto's Joker because I did genuinely like what Leto brought to the table like yeah. following up from Heath Ledger that's a big act to fill and Leto Huge came act. from it with a completely different angle and I think that his he was a victim of whoever put that bloody movie together not his performance and so it's just I found this is so much about the DC films from the mid two thousand mid twenty tens that were just it felt like lost opportunities. Like it felt like if they just slightly tweaked it or they just greenlit films in a different order, it probably would have been a stronger franchise if they also didn't try to copy Marvel because let's face it, nothing nothing is ever going to come close to what we got under Kevin Feige for three phases of Marvel. Um, and I think we should probably segue to that. anyone else has any other final comments on DC films from the 2010s. Oh, all right, cool. So um, I'm just going to read out a list of films to everyone. Um, and I just want you to note that these movies, the first one came out on the 2nd of May, 2008. So phase one, Iron Man, The Incredible Hulk, Iron Man 2, Thor, Captain America, The Avengers. Brilliant. All of those films, superb. Phase two. Iron Man 3, Thor, The Dark World, Captain America, Winter Soldier, Guardians of the Galaxy, Avengers Age of Ultron, Ant-Man. So we're now seven years and we move into phase three. Captain America, Civil War, Doctor Strange, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2, Spider-Man Homecoming, Thor, Ragnarok, Black Panther, Avengers Infinity Ward, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Captain Marvel, Avengers Endgame, Spider-Man Far From Home, July 2019. That's nine years it's staggering that they managed to achieve that in nine years so i'm just sort of curious you know just to throw it out like why do we think that that decade of marvel we'll say that decade of marvel how did they do it like how was it so well planned so well executed and so well interconnected that that became the high point of this genre. I think they actually planned well in advance with this. Um, and they pulled from properties that weren't really high up on the list because they didn't have access to Spider-Man and its plethora of villains. Mm -hmm. They didn't have access to um, the X-Men. And I say, thank God, because if they did have X-Men, we would not have gotten those films. I'm just going to put that out there. I don't think that if they had access to X-Men in the early stages of their planning of this cinematic universe, we would have got what we got today. Mm -hmm. um, because they would have... I mean, you saw it. They tried to do the bloody um, Inhumans in that TV show, the Inhumans, to try and get them into the 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 mutant role. And then obviously that was shit because they cut off Medusa's hair in the first bloody episode. And there goes all her powers. And it was just shit. But anyway... Um, <laughs> I do think that they did have a couple of questionable movies in there. Um, I'm a big Thor fan. So um, I was a little bit disappointed by Thor 2, The Dark World. Um, it was all right, but it wasn't what I was expecting. And I don't think that film kind of, or that property found its legs until Ragnarok, which was yeah. a phenomenal. And it didn't get its legs until, until the Guardians came out. Yeah, um, so right. because yeah. Guardians was successful with the, the, the um, comedic route, they could kind of do that with Thor because um, they, they showed it could work. So I think there's some really good stuff in there. I think there's some kind of all right stuff. But I do like the uh, Playboy billionaires with lots of tech characters from both worlds, from DC and Marvel. That character and both worlds, I love that character. Um if those that are listening and don't understand, that's Batman and Iron Man. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I also love Thor and Aquaman. Like, I could care less about the other DC characters, uh, but those in Marvel, the ones that I, I go for, my they're thoughts. great. I love them. Anyway, uh, my thoughts. Thanks, mate. Uh, Kurt? Oh, where to start? Um, MCU for me... I've always thought they've had a few too many characters. You sort of get lost 
in the universe of who's fighting who, who's friends with who, who hates who. Whereas the DC universe is sort of smaller. We have... Yeah, that's why it's always been a favourite for me. Even though I do love a fair few movies from the um, MCU as well, but especially the Iron Man series. I've been a massive fan since the original Iron Man. I just... It's just one of those movies that you don't have to take it too seriously. It's funny and semi-serious at the same time. Like, it's just a really good movie. You can just sit down and enjoy the all three of them I thought were fantastic but that's just the nerdy side of me with being able to see like robotic suits and whatnot. that's what um, draws me to that every single time uh, uh, Julian 10 years of Marvel what are your what's your retrospective takeaway uh, to answer your original question about why it was so successful, I think it's a combination of a few factors. I think Feige said that he basically shadowed um, Sam Raimi on the Spider-Man trilogy and basically learned and like picked his brain and was his coffee guy and his understudy for the most part. So he learned what to do, what not to do. I think uh, it was also a case of choosing actors that Hollywood and audiences really liked for Iron Man 1, I think when everyone saw that Robert Downey Jr. and Jeff Bridges uh, were doing this movie and put in like actually seriously good performances, it was like, okay, wait, we might have something here. I think the casting for the rest of the Avengers was pretty much perfect. Maybe Jeremy Jeremy Renner and um, Mark Ruffalo don't do as much for me. but still, it was a very... Stay away from Jeremy song. Renner. Hawkeye gets enough crap. We don't need to be critiquing him personally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not critiquing him. I, I just don't think he uh, holds a candle against the rest of that crew. So, just like, fun fact about Jeremy Renner. Do you guys actually know that his side business is that he's an interior designer and makeup artist? Really? Yeah. Yeah, so he, he has an interior design business, which is his like side gig. That's kind of where he like he does like his his non acting money, mm-hmm. and he learned how to become a make makeup artist because he discovered it was a great way to meet women. That's fair enough. Maybe I should take out this bachelor pad with some makeup, some table. Yeah, we we really have to work out your uh, your feng shui for it, Julian, because that's definitely not the first thing that she wants to see when she walks in. It's going to raise more questions than you want to have answered at that point. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, Julian, apologies. I, yeah. Okay, so. I think another big factor is scheduling these movies pretty much one film after another. It's like, what, an eight-month, six-month gap uh, in between each of them. So there is enough connective tissue but enough propulsion where it's something new for audiences. I don't think we've had a series like this where movies have been scheduled within 12 months of each other. So to have connective tissue, but also the gap in between each of these movies is smaller than any other franchise. It was something new. It was something exciting. And it was something that generally, tonally, wasn't very difficult to stay away from. It was light. It was breezy. It was, you didn't have to think. In it, you just had to go turn off your brain, enjoy good looking people, good looking visuals, um, and discussions with the boys and the girls after. So, there was a combination of a few things and a, a shitload of luck as well for all this to actually work, especially with the Thor stuff and how that influenced the Avengers, uh, alien and, and, and spacey side of things. Um, so it was a combination of a few things. And then them capitalizing on what worked well in phase one, refining it and taking even bigger risks, like getting the bloody Russo brothers from community to do something like winter soldier and the immense gamble of that act. And then everyone realizing that, Oh my God, winter soldier is like the best fucking movie since the dark Knight, I guess. Sure. I guess four years, five years. Um, but still, um, yeah, them capitalizing on things that worked and discarding things that didn't work. So that's how I view that decade, just them getting better and better. 
So I, I think that there's probably there's probably a couple of things that I think really defined that decade for Marvel. Um, I I think people underestimate the first Thor film and how vital that was to the entire MCU. Um, I, I remember being pretty into sort of like movie podcasts around that time. And I remember listening to um, IGN's Keeping It Real, uh, which was a IGN movies podcast from that period. And there was a lot of commotion around the fact that they brought in Kenneth Branagh to direct Thor. And Marvel was really trying to make a statement with it that these films are, they wanted to have a sort of an hour tour sort of approach to the movies where they really wanted to try to make the films standalone stories, but with Marvel characters. And, and you see that a lot with phase one and phase two. Um, and Kenneth Branagh's Thor is a good example of that, where that's a movie that's about a family feud. That's got nothing to do with the, the broader implications of the Thor universe. It's literally a family feud movie that takes back, you know, takes place in backyard of Nebraska effectively. Um, but, but what that enabled it to do was that it set this template up in the early phases of Marvel where every film was kind of its own genre story. So everything was kind of a bit different, you know, um, Iron Man is probably the, the exception to that just to, and I'll come back to that for why in a second. But if you look at the initial incredible Hulk film with Edward Norton, that's a really interesting movie. Like I know that's the black sheep of the of the MCU, but that's that's an interesting movie. What Edward Norton was trying to do with that character and that interpretation of the character, you know, he was very much trying to sort of embrace the Jekyll Hyde component of that character in itself. Um, the first Thor movie is a good example of you know a family feud that just happens to have Norse gods. Um, the first Captain America movie is the sequel to the um, Rocketeer that we never got. And it's for all intents and purposes, just a, you know, it's a man out of time film. It's a, it's a classic Hollywood Indiana Jones style movie. You then start moving into the phase two stuff. And, you know, I personally, I think that phase two of Marvel is one of the most interesting because you have three of the, you have two of the worst Marvel films back to back, which is Iron Man three and Thor the Dark World. And what you see with Iron Man and Thor, unfortunately, is these were movies that were heavily dependent on the films that came before them. So Thor The Dark World really didn't have that much to do with Avengers, apart from the Loki, the fallout of Loki. And sorry, let me rephrase that, sorry. Thor The Dark World had too much to do with Avengers because of Loki. And it was about continuing the Loki storyline uh, and what happens with that. And it's I don't think it's a terrible film by any stretch, but it's not... It, it, it Ragnarok worked better because Ragnarok stood on its own. Thor The Dark World requires you to have seen the Avengers to understand what's happening in it. And I think that with Iron Man 3, unfortunately, that's the end of the Tony Stark trilogy. But Iron Man 3 doesn't really do anything new with Iron Man. Like, he's not in a different place, really. He effectively is overcoming his trauma from his near-death experience in Avengers. But again, it's directly related to Avengers. But then following that, you have three of the best Marvel films, which is the you know, Winter Soldier, which is Marvel taking, you know, going hardcore into genre thriller. Um, you then have Guidance of the Galaxy, which is one of my all-time favorite films from that period of time, which is just James Gunn being let loose with characters that by all accounts should not have worked. There was nothing about Guidance of the Galaxy on paper that should have worked as well as it did, but you give it to a competent director and you give him free reign for the story. Then you have Avengers Age of Ultron, which was probably the weakest of all of the four Avengers films so far. Um, we'll see whether that's the case with Secret Wars. And then you have Ant-Man, which was just cursed by delays and rewrites and changing production. And and so I, like, I'd just be curious, sort of throwing it around to phase two, you, I think that what you see in phase two is the best and the worst of Marvel. And I think that unfortunately the worst of Marvel failed because, or is bad because of how beholden it was to the films that came before it. And I think that that's kind of the state that we're in presently, but I'd just be curious as to what your guys thoughts are on sort of those phase two films. I really think, um, I am one of those people that I think the biggest mistake Marvel made was bringing Loki back. Yep. Um, I am not a fan of Loki. Um, 
uh, in the Marvel Universe. Yeah. Great in the first one, continuing, mm, not really a fan of. However, um, this the TV series, great, loved it. But in the movies, nah, not a fan of Loki. I, f- I found him to be quite annoying, and that's when I was like, oh, God, do we really have to just rehash this because someone had a little fangirl crush on him? When I say someone, I mean the entire female population for the comic book universe. And obviously, you know, girlfriends are coming to the movies with their boyfriends to see this, and this is the only way they can do it. And they're like, oh, Tom Hiddleston, yay. Well, clearly, we need to bring him back to get the, the female um, buy-in, which I really just didn't like through that car, the next two phases. Um, I'm sure Tom through... Hiddleston would be touched by that comment. <laughs> oh, he, he, uh, well, he's certainly touching something. Um <laughs> anyway, uh, I also didn't particularly enjoy... Like, I loved Iron Man. I love Iron Man, the character. Iron Man 3, I was kind of like, mm, okay, sure, whatever. It's there. He showed up. I oh. think they probably should have put him on ice for a little bit and used him in the next phase. Sorry. Or uh, to have his own, Sully. So Iron Man 3 also has the other pitfall of Marvel, which is when a kid gets involved. So just to refer yeah. out, because that becomes important later on. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I think they could have rejigged the, the order of things to make things have a bit more sense. Um, so I think I mentioned to come in a later phase to give him a bit more breathing space. Cause we had two in the first, um, in the first phase, which obviously the first phase was, a, was four years, four years. Yes. And we got two Iron Man movies. Very rarely do we get that amount of the same character in the same amount of time frame. Like, yes, we get um, Captain America. No, no, it's it's the only Spider Man. Yeah, there's only one where it's a sequel within a single phase. Yeah, mm. and then you have Spider Man um, in the phase three. You get two of them, um, but you know, I kind of I count them, but I don't count them at the same time as Marvel because technically they're owned by Sony. The, the properties anyway, or licensed to Sony. Uh, but yeah, I thought it was all right. Um, and I thought the, the first Guardians was great. Um, I am but one of those people who didn't really like Winter Soldier. Um, yeah, yeah, you can you can walk out. That's fine. Um, <laughs> there he goes. Is it because you hate Robert Bradford? Um, Is that why? <laughs> no. Um, Sebastian Stan. I'm not uh, a fan. Yeah. Uh, because that relationship between Cap and um, Winter Soldier, I was not a fan of. Yeah. Because I'm very much on the straight and narrow path. Like, you, you're breaking the rules now. Like, Captain America is like the all American guy that's like always follows the rules, like what you aspire to be. And then he's done a flipping, um, gone the wrong way, is how I viewed it. So that's kind of why I don't like the Bucky character, yeah. um, which made me not like The Winter Soldier for that reason. It was a great movie, don't get me wrong, but at the end of it, I'm like, nah, I hate that. I don't like it. <laughs> oh, that's fair. Anyway. Um, and then I was really annoyed with Age of Age of Ultron because, you know, let's bring in the mutants without calling them mutants. What, what was the phrase that they were using back then? Because um, they, they had a term that they were using had for a, it. Um, I don't know. I don't remember. I just want to say they said gifted. It was enhanced or something. It was... Evolutionary or something. I don't know. Whatever. But yeah, um, because I like the idea of um, Quicksilver, which I was a little bit annoyed that he got. Um, He was killed. Sorry, spoiler alert. Uh, But he pops up again in Craven the Hunter coming up soon. Um, and, (laughs) uh, And Scarlet Witch. I think she's a great character and... In that movie, I don't think she was fully explained because they couldn't explain her. Yeah. That's... Uh, thanks, man. Oh, Kurt. Oh, I don't know. For me, over that next series of years, um, I probably only watched the Guardians of the. G- G- Galaxy season, really. Um, series, sorry. Mainly because, yeah, once again, sort of, not really like Iron Man, but the same sort of easy watching 
theme for me. It was funny. They had really, really, really good actors. Funny characters. Awesome soundtrack. Really awesome soundtrack. Uh, probably Ant-Man as well. I don't know. I know it didn't do as well as a lot of the other um, MCU movies, but I enjoyed it. Mainly because of the main character. I thought he was awesome. But yeah, apart from that though, nothing else really rang any bells for me. Oh, fair enough. Uh, Julian? Phase 2's highs were so high that I could forgive its minor lows. Yep. For me, Guardians and Winter Soldier were like, wow, these are just truly wonderful gifts to the human race. Um, so I, I can sacrifice Thor Dark World. Iron Man 3 I actually like as a breather. It's not a full episode for me. It's a breather when I want eternal change. And I fully agree with Rowan that it should have been saved for uh, Phase 3, Iron Man 3. But I think the, the one character that has so strong a presence in the rest of the movies, which is Iron Man, um, I feel like... The, this entire saga is the Iron Man saga as much as it is the Infinity Saga. You don't need another Iron Man movie after Iron Man 2. You could jump straight to uh, Age of Ultron. You could jump straight to Civil War. Civil War is, to me, Iron Man 4. Uh, it's, it's not as much about the Bucky and Captain Thing as it is about seeing Tony... Tony's psychology, basically. That's the, the deepest dive into Tony's psychology, yeah. Um, so Phase 2 was just more experimentation, more gambling, more paying off, um, and very importantly, more really, really well-regarded actors coming into the fray, such as Robert Redford, um, saying, you know what, I'm just going to completely eliminate anyone's fear of this MCU, uh, and I'm going to just give a pretty great performance in it. Um, what a memorable villain, what a memorable presence. Um, and more importantly, it, it sets up, it, it very much is that middle chapter where you can't blow your entire load. So you need to make these wonderful films, but also give the audience something to hang on to so that phase three can be as truly epic as it really is. So it does all those things really well. All right. So hang on to what you just said then, middle chapter. Okay. So we're moving into phase three. Uh, I'm just going to repeat the list again um, just so we've got some context of what we're talking about because it does a lot of films. So we kick off with Captain America Civil War. We then go into Doctor Strange or Iron Man with Magic. We then go into Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, which was a fascinating production cycle to make that film. Um, we then get Thor Ragnarok, Black Panther, and then we kick off with Avengers Infinity War, we didn't get Ant-Man and the Wasp and then we get Captain Marvel and then we get Avengers Endgame and finally Spider-Man Far From Home. So we actually get two Spider-Man films in the same phase. So apologies, we do actually get two in this one, sorry. Um, I think that it's probably worth talking, doing this one in two stages. So we might just talk from Civil War up to Black Panther. Um, from my part, I... This was when it became apparent to me that Marvel had just entirely adopted the episodic format. We were now watching seasons of TV that were akin to you know, Game of Thrones or whatever else was popular back then. And we were working towards the season finale. And from a from a film perspective, you know, there are definitely some weaker films. Like I didn't think Doctor Strange was that good, personally. Um but the at this point, the weakest film was still telling and contributing to an amazing story. And so I could forgive the sins of what was happening in Phase 3. Because like, I, I actually did not like Captain America Civil War. Um, I really That movie did nothing for me. Um, there's, there's parts of it I dug, but it, overall it didn't do anything for me. Um, I absolutely love Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I'm not going to lie. I got a bit teary at the end of that. You know, that moment um, Cat Stevens comes on playing Father and Son, I'm always going to get a bit teary. And Spider-Man was brilliant. Um, I think Tom Holland is wonderful interpretation of that character and the, the sort of the energy and the enthusiasm he brings to it really sets the part from Garfield and Maguire. And I love that that guy made it his own. And 
Thor Ragnarok is hilarious. Um, just, I, I mean, like it's it's just it's just funny. Like I don't know how else to describe that movie. Like they just they really embraced the tonal shift. They didn't become beholden to what came before it. And Chris Hemsworth is a hilarious comedic actor. And I think that Loki actually worked well in that film, being a, a comedic foil to Chris Hemsworth. Um, and Black Panther is the most unintentional Republican film I've watched in my entire life. And I absolutely love how just outright conservative that movie is and people don't see the subtext of that film. But I just want to point out that that film is about maintaining a mon monarchical ethno-nationalist state. And the hero is the one that's inheriting the monarchy in order to maintain his ethno-national state. That is literally Black Panther. It is fucking hilarious. <laughs> but at the end, doesn't he say that it's about time we actually share this wealth with the rest of the world? Yes, but that's not inviting the rest of the world into Wakanda. <laughs> they maintain their island. That's the point. <laughs> But um, yeah, Chadwick, Chadwick Boseman in that film was brilliant. Um, he's definitely a shame. He, he died too soon, unfortunately, that guy. But yeah, so anyway, that's I, I just before we go into sort of the the cherry on top of this one, what are, what are your guys' thoughts on first half of Phase 3? I might go first because I'll be the, the quickest here. <laughs> um, I only watched the Guardians of the... Galaxy Volume 2 and Ant-Man and the Wasp. That's literally all I watched out of those ones because, yeah, I just wasn't really into any of the other ones, to be honest. But I saw them when I watched the trailers. I don't know. It just didn't really interest me, to be honest. But I think that's because I'm more of a um, DC Universe fan more than yeah, MCU. Uh, Julian? Wonderful energy. Uh, with each movie, you feel it rising up to what will eventually be the climax. Wonderful setting up of storylines and moving the needle forward bit by bit. Uh, Civil War, I unashamedly love. I think it's a wonderful sequel to Winter Soldier, but also being Iron Man 4. And it's got my favorite act three out of everything besides Endgame yeah, and, and the MCU. Exactly. I think mean, yeah, we'll talk about Endgame in a second, but Civil War Act Three is basically uh, Tony Stark being a man child and wreaking havoc on the world because well, the world as in his friends, uh, because he can't control his emotions. And I think that's a very brave move from a storytelling standpoint to have your one savior your meant to be your greatest savior become a child. Uh, and become an antagonist or for a movie, I think that's really, really wonderful. As cheesy as the politics was in terms of red versus blue, freedom versus control, uh, that, that, you know, Captain versus Iron Man had, their frenemy fight and the, the, the two sides, I thought was wonderful. And that, to me, also was Avengers 3. It, it was more than just a uh, team battle. It, it was really Avengers 3 for me personally. So I'm smitten with that movie. Um, Thor Ragnarok is, as you said, hilarious, Reese. And it, it was just such a breath of fresh air considering we had Thor Dark World preceding it. So I think the juxtaposition between the two added to how good this was and to have someone with such uh, a singular directorial style from Waititi is really important. The fact that they keep bringing these really curveball directors and, and tones into the MCU, I think it's really important. And, and a lot of times they do fail and that's fine, but yeah, really good there. Uh, Black Panther was uh, wonderful, emotional, it called back to our childhood Lion King fantasies, but with adults this time. Um, very intentional, the homages to The Lion King there. Uh, the soundtrack was uh, the best thing out of uh, the MCU to that point, in, in, in my opinion. So, yeah, I was spinning with that movie. Uh, Doctor Strange, I was meh on. In Bento Box, Cucumber Batch is uh, wonderful, but the movie itself, I skip it every time. Yeah, it's. I, I rewatched it um, at the start of this year because I just had a bit of a, a whim just to rewatch it when the, the other one came out, um, the second, and 
it's it's literally just Iron Man beat for beat. It's Iron Man, but with magic instead of technology. And it was such a um such a shame because that could have been a very fascinating film. Um and but it it it, it became very formulaic and we start to see that more and more going forward from this point, unfortunately. Uh Rowan. I apologize, Jules, because I think I actually got uh, Civil War and Winter Soldier mixed up. Uh, so the first half of uh, Civil War was what I was not really enjoying as much. I think, yeah, so I think I got those confused. So I apologize. Um, but I also wanted to touch on your third act with uh, Iron Man becoming the, the giant man-child because um, they couldn't do the alcoholic storyline where he beats his wife. So that's the only way they could do that. So in the comics, that's mm. Tony Stark. Just FYI. Um, so they couldn't really do the dark Tony as they would have done in the comics. Um, so they kind of had to do it this way, in a way. So I actually really enjoyed most of these movies as well. Um, Guardians, again, fun. I think they're a good breath of fresh air amongst all of the, the other ones. I do like the introduction of Mystic Marvel. So obviously we've had um, the Cosmic Marvel not quite yet introduced, but kind of in a way with Guardians 1. And then this one, we've got Guardians 2. So we've got a little bit more of the Cosmic Marvel. And now we've got the introduction of Mystic Marvel. So for those that don't know, there's like three different levels of Marvel. So there's like um, the Avengers kind of team, world, our world based. And there's like the Mystic Marvel, which deals with alternate dimensions and all that kind of stuff. Then there's like the Cosmic, which is out in space, which I think is what I really want to see. Um, so I'm looking forward to stuff coming up in the future. Um, with Mystic Marvel stuff. Uh, oh, sorry, Mystic Marvel and also um, Cosmic stuff. But I think um, to have at the end of that kind of half phase where we're talking about the Homecoming, Ragnarok and Black Panther all within like six months of each other-ish, six months, seven months, was phenomenal. Um, but I do think this is where they kind of start to cram too many movies into the one year because... Um, if you look at phase one and phase two, we've got 12 movies. And then for phase three, we have 11. So phase one is six, phase two is six, and then phase three is 11. I think it went for a little bit too long. Yeah. So I think we should have cut a little bit earlier with this phase. But yeah. Black Panther was, I think, is where they should have started the phase 3.5 or whatever. Because it's a great, great movie. I loved it. Um, and to see the effect that it had on um, communities out there as well that haven't had representation in the cinematic universe i think it was phenomenal to see that and the music top notch i still listen to it to this day it's great it, it, it's it's i i do love that movie but that's also partly because it's one step away from make wakanda great again hats that everyone's wearing so it's that that movie was um unintentionally hilarious for me <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay, so now we kick off with arguably the high point of the entire comic book movie genre. Captain Marvel, right? I don't know. Oh. Oh, we're going to talk about Captain Marvel in a second. That's um, true. That's... Avengers Infinity War and the snap. Now, Endgame, obviously the bigger film, but for my money, I think Infinity War is the better movie. Um, and... I think that Infinity War is the the reward that fans of Marvel got for nine years of dedication to the franchise. And I remember watching the snap on opening day um, and this, the theater was just silent. Um, I cannot think of another film, even Han Solo getting killed in, you know, episode seven. I don't think it had that sort of impact that, the snap had on Infinity War. Um, now, I might just quickly, yeah, we'll just quickly go around. What what was everyone's thoughts on Infinity War? Great. Loved it. The balancing act between tones of all these different levels and families and groups actually worked. There were moments where it just ever so slightly buckled tonally but by the end of it it all just evened out and the fact that you can combine them all was just amazing uh and 
I, as you said, Reese, I think this is the payoff to everything. This is the payoff to all the experimentation we've had, even pre MCU. The fact that you can make a movie this cosmic and have it work on a narrative, emotional, visual level and have it be a spectacle throughout. And also the fact that the protagonist of the movie is the villain, he is the protagonist, and every superhero is just getting in his way. And they are, to me, the antagonists. I think that wonderful reversal uh, was the most interesting thing and just the icing on the cake when you look back on that film. And I think that's something that's worth noting with Thanos is how well they introduced his character. Now, obviously, he'd been floating around since the first Avengers movie. But your your introduction to Thanos is him outboxing the Hulk. You know, the Hulk is the most powerful brawler in the MCU at that point. And Thanos just intelligently destroys him in one-on-one combat. Like just the way that they set him up as being this formidable villain that is physically smarter and more powerful than the most powerful physical character in the MCU was just... Like, those guys hit it out of the park with every aspect of that film. Uh, Rob? Um, I do want to backtrack one second as well for uh, Iron Man. I'm actually getting Iron Man and Ant-Man mixed up because they both wear suits. Ant-Man is the one that has the uh, drinking problem and the abusive against his wife. Anyway, um, because we're going to talk about Ant-Man in this section too. So um, I think Infinity War was was great. I kind of mix Infinity War and Endgame all in one kind of thing because it's just watching them back to back because they literally are a back to back type situation. Um, I think yeah, I think that were done really well. And after having Thanos teased for nine years or whatever it was, and then to finally have him, like I would rename these movies to Thanos One and Thanos Two, like because it was his movie, yeah, really. That's a, it was. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of like we got the first kind of villain storyline, villain focused movie, and I thought that yeah, I thought they were amazing. Um, and it, as I as sitting in the cinema when the snap happened, just was something you would not never have predicted. Um, and to have everyone kind of keep it under wraps, um, f- yeah, it was just. And to have, I think they didn't have that warning at the start as well, just not say anything yeah they, 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 they tried to do like a community Q and A thing yeah. about it um, like yeah keep it to yourself don't ruin it for anyone else no. um, I think it was quite clever as well but to have that payoff of having Thanos actually there you know the third version of his image because we've had three different kind of visual images of him um, but he in that Infinity War he was big and imposing and went toe to toe and more so like he clearly outplayed them, outmaneuvered them. He was the ultimate survivor. Yep. It was brilliantly executed. Um, uh, Kurt? Yeah. I haven't seen either of them, to be honest <laughs> with you. <this. laughs> I, I I have heard really, really good things about them. Oh, man, I'm glad five years later you get to vicariously live the experience with the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just... I just, I just haven't seen them. Whether or not it's just by just pure laziness or loss of interest, that's probably more oh. or less what it is for me. So, well, um, just conscious of time, um, so we're ne- we're definitely not going to get around to post phase four. So we'll have to do a part two for this discussion, if that's okay, guys. Um, but. We'll finish with we'll fi- obviously we'll finish with Spider Man Far From Home. Um, but. In between Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, we got uh, two more films. So we got Ant-Man and the Wasp and Captain Marvel. Um, Now, Ant-Man and the Wasp, I don't have anything against Paul Rudd, but the Ant-Man character has always been sort of like the the poor cousin of the the MC, of the, um, the Avengers characters. Uh, So I don't have any real strong opinions either way. I think I only ever watched that movie once to be perfectly honest with you guys. Um, Does anyone have anything they want to say about Ant-Man and the Wasp? No. No, pretty much. No idea at the time either. Uh, Once you've seen it, you've seen it. There's no no need to to relive that movie. 
Um, I think uh, so it, sure. it works well as a palate cleanser because Infinity War tonally, you've got everyone depressed. So Ant Man and the Wasp almost resets that so that when we get to the dourness of Endgame, which is a very dour and somber movie, we have had two semi light hearted ish movies. So I think the placement of it was probably the best thing of it, regardless of the quality of the movie. Movie. Yep, fair enough. Captain Marvel. Um, I've, I really don't like this movie. Um, and this, this is one of those Marvel films that made a billion dollars. Um, and there is nothing about this film that's worth a billion dollars in my view. I, yeah, I'm don't, not a big fan of Brie Larson, even though I find her extremely attractive. It's very conflicting for me. Um, not a big fan of anything that's in, in this film at all. Um, and I certainly don't particularly like the Captain Marvel character either. Uh, and I think that Captain Marvel that was um, I think that Captain Marvel is an interesting example of the MCU films that come from pay, Phase Four onwards, where new characters become top tier without any struggle. And so one of the things that you see with particularly those earlier films, like these characters become more and more powerful as they overcome their own personal battles and their own personal issues. And so the sort of the strength and the role that these characters play directly correspond to the challenges that they face. I don't see any of that with Captain Marvel. I see a very, you know, I, I hate to use the expression here, but I see a very much a sort of a Mary Sue character that's perfect. There's no there's no flaws with this character and that in itself for me makes it a massive flaw. Um, but yeah, just, just curious um, what everyone else's views are on, on this film. No, nope. yeah, fair enough, Ron. I, uh, I enjoyed, I like, to be honest, I enjoy just going to the movies to see anything because I like the entertainment value. Mm. I'm not there for a highbrow stuff, but you know, if it is great, um as i said i like the i like cosmic marvel yeah, so, um yeah. so i'm i'm more interested in seeing some of this stuff um i don't i don't think it should have come at this phase at this at this point in the um in the overall infinity saga i i think it potentially should have been the multiverse saga um and i think i hate to say this but black widow should have been yeah earlier in the yeah. uh this the Black, Infinity Saga. Black, Black Widow should have been where this spot was, 100%. Uh, but actually before, because, you know, it related to Infinity War. Um, kind of. Because you, you see her well, in Infinity War, yeah. Well, Endgame, yeah. Scarlett Johans, or Black Widow is the only character that's really sacrificed in Endgame, apart from Gamora, but she comes back anyway. Um, for, I, I'm not even 100% sure how that happened, to be honest with you. Um, but... It, it, it would have made more sense thematically if Endgame was actually about Black Widow. And if you had the Black Widow film going into it, that would have really sort of set it up that she's the other character in this that loses everything. Um, yeah. Because Black Widow is also, I think, the... She's the second... No, the third Avenger character to be introduced in the whole thing because she gets introduced in Iron Man 2. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about in, in Endgame. Um, I lo really love Endgame. I don't think it's as good of a film as Infinity War. Um, but for something that is a total cameo fan service, let's make it work. Let's bring everyone into the film and make it work. I think it does a phenomenal job. Um, there's definitely parts of Endgame where there's... I don't think it's necessary and it's all that sort of thing where there's a lot of tokenistic moments which are just let's write a scene to get this character doing their bit for this for, for this bit of screen time and I think that at a certain point particularly during that last battle it kind of detracts from the stakes of it because you can see that so many of these characters have plot armor um but in saying that the the final snap you know the I am Iron Man line at the end and you know, Tony Stark 
most likely knowing that it was a one-way mission and you know what what's the sort of the scene when he gives up you know he, he has that realization where when he accepts when he actually is going to do it that there's probably a good chance he's not going to see his daughter grow up um you know there's there's definitely some there's definitely some pathos to the third or to the second um end game movie that i think really that it does deserve some kudos for what the Russo brothers managed to do within that film. It also does harken back to the original Iron Man where at the end of that movie, he's like, his iconic line at the end of that was, I am Iron Man. Yeah, it does. It really bookends it. So it it bookends that. And I think that's, that was really good of them in the way in which they did that as well. Um, And just thinking about um, like the movie in general, like they did actually have to do Captain Marvel at, for that movie to be successful yeah. because she turns up at the very end and goes toe to toe with Thanos. Like she and had to go into it because there was no other character in Marvel at that point in time that could go from what we had seen. Cause I can see Jules eyebrows raising um, uh, that we had seen in that cinematic universe so far that could go toe to toe with Thanos. So I get that, you know, she had to appear. I did like the, the, the call out in this film where you had, for two things, all the females in one scene together, working together, but then it just showed the, sorry to say this, but the lack of um, representation for other um, diverse um, people in that lot, the entire cinematic universe as well, because you had the Wakandan show up, they didn't get a scene all together running for it. Like, they were just, they were there. Um, that was it. And, and, so, and that, that female scene really, I mean, you know, the... The negative commentary is what they refer to as the you know, M she universe, and that female scene is always inevitably the thumbnail on that YouTube rant video. Um, it, it's it was making a it was a, it's it's making a statement, and yep. it's making a statement in not because that's what the film needed, but because Disney and Marvel were making a statement. And also a statement in response to DC, who also have already done Wonder Woman by this point. Well, yeah, well. And, uh, you know, I, I think in the next the next episode when we talk about the Black Widow film, I think it's definitely worth a discussion about just how fucked over Scarlett Johansson was with Black Widow, um, because there's a whole drama that go, that went into that movie and why it took so long to get for that to get made. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, Julian, sorry man, uh, any any final thoughts on Endgame? Endgame, yes, it's not as strong as Infinity War, and I think largely because it is three totally different movies in the yeah. one movie. Um, yeah. It's got the most amount of experimentation within a movie in the MCU that I, I think we've seen so far. It's, first of all, the first act is a breather. It's the first breather we've gotten. We've got palate cleansers like Ant-Man, but we've never had just drama for about 40 to 50 minutes as a stretch without much action at all. Um, so that was very interesting. Uh, it wasn't ultimately successful for me, but interesting. Act two was basically Ant-Man part three. It was a heist movie, uh, and it was fun. I, I enjoyed it. Some scenes could have been more effective. Uh, act three though, is for me, the absolute high point of the MCU and why I will always uh, defend Endgame. Um, Reese, with what you said before about certain characters being in that final fight because they kind of had to be there, um, I sort of see why they had to do it. My cousin pointed out to me that every line in that battle against Thanos in Act 3 is a payoff to a previously set up, uh, set up in Phase 2 and Phase 1. Uh, every character is making a reference to something they did or didn't do, and it pays off the end of their arc or the end of their relationship with someone else. Like... Uh, for example, my cousin made a really good point where when Black Panther meets uh, Hawkeye for the first time, uh, Hawkeye says, I'm Clint, and Black Panther says, I don't care in Civil War. And then in that final scene in, in Endgame, he actually yells out, Clint. Now, it's such a small thing, and it's so cheesy, but it's little things like that that make it work. When I think about the most rousing moments in cinema, I think of three things. In Lord of the Rings, uh, Two Towers, I think of the Ride of the Rohirrim. Return of the King, sorry. Return of the King. In Return of the King, I also think of Aragorn saying, you bow to no one, and bowing to the four hobbits. And I think of 
Captain America saying Avengers assemble and the main theme playing and everyone charging. Uh, you know, when you have like tears of like actual joy and you're in the moment, you're not crying because it's sad. You're crying because, oh my God, this, this surge of emotion with me, I don't know what to do, but fucking cry. Yes, that was me at Endgame. I, I didn't know what to do, how to feel in that moment, but oh my God, this is the most heroic thing I've seen. Um, so it gets absolute points for that. Uh, it is the, the three-way fight against Thanos just before the, the big fight was just heavenly. Um, Captain America receiving the hammer, Mjolnir, was one of the loudest cheers I've ever heard in a cinema because that moment was not Captain America receiving Mjolnir. It was you, the audience member, after 11 years, finally being worthy enough to hold this. It, 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 was, it was us in that moment, which is why it felt so cathartic. That was the start of the catharticness, whatever the noun is. Um, and it, it just continued from, uh, from, from, from the Avengers Assemble line to everything paying off. And then I'm, I'm in saying that iconic line and then the funeral scene at the end. Uh, it's just perfection for me. And one of my favorite moment, moments, 20 minute stretches in cinema. I'm so happy. So, so happy we got to experience this. Come on. Uh, and Kurt, you haven't seen it, have you? Does this sound, does this uh, sound <laughs> enticing? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I promise before the next podcast, I will watch those two movies. All right. We're, we're so, probably, we're probably going to do the next War, one in about a fortnight's Endgame. time. Um, but yeah, so you got, you've got you probably no got about two weeks. But right. I'll write now, it down. Now, uh, so we're going to talk about the last film, and I do apologize because I, I was intending it would get further ahead in time, but uh, I started waxing lyrical about nostalgic movies from the 2010s, so that's becoming more of a problem as I get older. I'm noticing. Um, Avengers Endgame finishes one of the biggest films of all time. Tony Stark is dead. Spoilers, Kurt. Um, and ruined it. Yeah, and arguably the best villain arc is finished and what happens next and pretty much immediately afterwards like six weeks later seven weeks later we get spider-man far from home which effectively picks up from the world in which the snap has happened so everything's jumped forward five years in time um it's introducing uh Spider-Man as potentially the next central character of the MCU and it's trying to figure out what the MCU looks like after the final act which has just happened and I just want to sort of leave it here just to sort of tease out the next episode but I kind of think that Captain Marvel and Spider-Man Far From Home really begin to signal the decline that's about to happen to the MCU in their own way. And I think that Spider-Man Far From Home is a movie that struggles to deal with the aftermath of just how amazingly well done those three phases of Marvel were and, and the MCU is struggling to try to come up with something that's going to continue it. And I think that Captain Marvel is trying to throw darts at the board to find a character that's going to fill the void that's been left over after we lose Iron Man and Captain America. So I just wanted to sort of leave on that and just get your guys' thoughts on um, sort of if you do agree, disagree, and you know what your sort of your closing comments are around, you know, what was admittedly an amazing decade of films. I think there's... Um more to it than than what we we've been shown um i do think yes there is um we've gone through a bit of a rough patch in the last five years four years whatever it's been um since these movies um and uh i think that apart from marvel trying to bash out a agreement with Sony so they can bring in the the Spider-Man uh, villains and um, characters um, 
Because did uh, do they have X Men at this stage? I don't know if they had Fox here. No, not at yet. Twenty nineteen. Fox, Fox comes so, in phase four. Yeah, so I think they were still trying to figure out how they could do that kind of those storylines from the because let's be honest, X Men's have a lot of different storylines that they could pull from for different things, but they can't really do that without without them. And so I think them trying to figure out how they can go forward at the same time and also in the background, that deal's being worked on, let's be honest. They're going to have been working on that Fox deal for years trying to get that across the line. Um, so I think they were just kind of in like a holding pattern, which is why we got what we got for a little while. Um, but I think it was the end of a, a very good era for Marvel. Um, as I said earlier, I think it could have been a little bit shorter in Phase 3 um, and space things out a little bit more, maybe change the timelines around a little bit more. Um, have different movies come out at certain times, but I think it was good, and it does kind of precursor that there is something on the horizon that may not uh, work because they've announced all these other shows and movies that may not have come to fruition. Spoiler. Uh, Julian? You are right, Rings. I think they are trying to fill that void, and they kind of have to. They have to experiment because just like the first thought, it was a bit of experimentation to see what works, what the audience reacts to, what they don't react to. And I think you kind of need to do it. Um, and it's very fitting that it's Peter's character that is hailed as the new um, leader or the central figure because Tony literally did mentor him. So from a narrative standpoint, who better to take on the mantle than the person who you know was mentored by the one we all love? So I get it. Well, I think that um, to close this episode out, there is one thing that we we will be discussing in the next episode of Uncommonly Common Conversations, and that's the um, the the shadowy villain on the horizon. Um, Kevin which, Feige? No, no, no. But we'll get to Kevin Feige, uh, which is Disney Plus. And and so I think that the next episode, and we'll, we'll discuss Kevin Feige in the next episode, definitely. But I think, I think what's probably worth discussing in part two of this is sort of the state of comic book movies from 2019 to now, because a lot, ha even though there's been a massive decline in, in my opinion, the, the overall quality, um, there has been a lot that's come out, and you know I think the last sort of comment I'm going to make is that the entirety of phase four in terms of the amount of minutes required to watch is more than the entirety of phases one, two, and three combined. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's probably, that, that's what we'll start the conversation with on next, on next episode. But um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you all for, for, for coming tonight. I think we've hit an hour and a half, hour 40. So that's actually a pretty good stint. So that, that's lovely. Thanks. Thanks guys. Um, yeah. Any, any final comments guys? I have a lot, a lot to watch over the next fortnight. Oh yeah, wait till you get to phase four, man. Just <laughs> I haven't even watched all of it. Spoilers. <laughs> I'm just looking at looking at some of the like She-Hulk, for instance. Well, yeah, yeah. There's conversation. <laughs> yeah, uh, Julian. Uh, I'm really glad I got to join this discussion because. Phases one, two, three in the MCU is is a privilege that we've we've received, I think, in life. So I'm really happy. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks, man. Thanks for joining us, man. You going to join us for the next one? Most likely. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Rowan? Go ahead, go and watch them all. We'll be expecting a blow by blow uh, review of each of them. Yeah, as I'm, you gonna be, watch them. I'm gonna be pop quizzing you next time, Kurt. <laughs> I'm gonna have multiple screens open with just all the movies ready to go and. Uh, you ask me a question, I'd be like, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Playing double speed. Well, yeah, arguably, exactly. you could probably put several of them together at the same time and they're beat for beat the same movie, just with a different color palette and character. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah, exactly right. Oh, awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us tonight, guys. Um, yeah, lovely. I'll we'll, we'll chat to you all soon. Have a good night. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Have a good night. So.